was your initial reaction to those pictures? You may have heard of bias, but how much do you know about implicit bias? That's an unconscious reaction to a person or a group of people, which affects how we think and how we behave. So let's get straight to it. Good evening to you, I'm Ed Ranch. We'd like to welcome all of the people who are here with us tonight, watching, of course, on our 7 Plus app using Roku, Fire Stick, Apple TV, and Android TV. In the last hour, Dr. Bryant Marks of Morehouse College helped us confront our own implicit bias with the script special, The Hidden Bias of Good People. And we want to keep the conversation going with representatives from the National Federation for Just Communities. In this first half hour, we'll be speaking with members of the NFJC of Western New York's Youth Board. In the second half hour, you'll hear from members of the Adult Board. So joining me with Students Perspective is our panel tonight, our panel of youth voices, Jamal Harrell Harris Jr., Sam Farrell, and Jordan Horn. Thank you all so much for being here with me tonight. We certainly appreciate you. Uh, first off, Jordan, we'll start, uh, Jamal, rather, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm interested, what was your initial reaction to Dr. Mark's presentation? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mark does a tremendous job with his presentation. He's very well informed, smart, he's a great explainer, and he does a great job of, you know, going, do, talking about the uncomfortable, uncomfortable stuff. So uh, I liked a lot of what Dr. Mark talked about. I related to a lot of what Dr. Mark um, talked about, you know, being a minority myself. And I think he does a great job with this entire presentation. Jordan, your response here to all of this too. I mean, this is something that is uncomfortable to confront. So what did you think about it? Um, I mean, I think in general, it's unfortunate that people hear the like fact that we all have bias and immediately say, no, I don't like thinking that we're all more high and mighty than um, we actually are in reality. Like, like Dr. Marks was saying, we all have bias. It helps us in life. It's based off, off of our experiences. And I think the most important point that I took from his presentation was that it's not about saying I don't have bias. It's about, it's about being conscious of it, addressing it when you are going, when it's going to affect a situation or how you treat someone, situations like that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, Jordan, that you say that because, you know, I think of all the presentations that we've seen and we've been seeing a lot these days, right? It kind of gave us the why instead of like the your wrong perspective or you are or you shouldn't be thinking this way, um, you know, how to change your perspective. This gives us the, the basis to why we, we do think this way. Uh, Sam, uh, I'm interested, what did you think about all this? Did it make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, um, I think what was really great about um, Dr. Mark was he really started off most of his points by building common ground with the right. audience. So by building this common ground, he already established that you and I are not so different after all. Um, and then kind of moving on from that, he could really start to build his logical arguments. And from that like point, you really like wanted to believe what he said. And because of this really strong foundation of building common ground, um, kind of saying that everybody is biased. I've got bias, you've got bias, and here's how I can tell you. Um, I think that was really one of the strongest parts of his presentation. So Sam, let me just follow up with you. Do you have any new perspectives based on this presentation? Yeah, so I think one of the cool, not coolest, but one of the most informative things that um, Dr. Mark really had you do was take yourself and put yourself in somebody else's shoes for mm -hmm. a minute. And putting yourself in the shoes of somebody who is kind of regarded as lesser in society and regarded as dangerous or a criminal and kind of imagining how I would feel in that situation and how I would kind of change my own self-worth based on that situation. I feel like that's one of the, I felt like that was really powerful. You hear those words and you see that word cloud that uh, Dr. Marks put up on the screen. Jamal, did it all take you out of your comfort zone? Uh, no, not, not necessarily because, you know, you know, I, I live it. So it's not necessarily anything you know, I'm surprised about or necessarily shocked about. It actually gave me kind of a, you know, a good chuckle, you know, seeing the words up there and, you know, like, oh, I didn't think about that one that, you know, that makes sense. Um, so no, it didn't really take me out of my uh, my comfort zone per se and seeing the word cloud. Now, let me ask you, I mean, so since you kind of say that you live it, what have you lived? What are some of the examples of what you've been through, what you've confronted and how do you overcome? Uh, you know, pe you know, uh, people assuming stuff of you, uh, 
you know, stuff like that. Um, you overcome it by, you know, kind of just, you know, putting it in the back door of your mind, you know, just, just being yourself, you know, and, you know, just control what you control, do what you do, and, you know, good things will happen. And, of course, there's going to be, um, you know, we're not denying the problems in this world. Things will happen. There's racism and stuff out there. But, you know, just do you, um, work hard, and, you know, good will happen to you. Almost like you know your self-worth. Yes. And I think that's probably the most important thing, uh, you know, as a, as a person, you know, somebody, you know, they say sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt. Words hurt, right? But you have to be able to kind of rise above and take the high road, it seems like, is what you're saying. Is that accurate? Yeah, words hurt if you allow them to hurt, of course. So if you just, you know, yeah, that's hard to do. You know, you can't, you can't cancel out all those words and, you know, um, so if you allow them to hurt, they will hurt. If you don't allow them to hurt, they won't hurt. And you exactly, you know what your self worth is. And so, you know, do you and good things will happen. I love that phrase, do you. Jordan, any new perspectives after seeing this presentation? Um, I, I think Dr. Marks definitely opened my eyes to a lot of specifics and I really liked his kind of motif that he kept saying, like, you are a person, you have a brain and you're in society. Right. Like that was what going back to what Sam was talking about, that way of connecting with the audience, being on a common ground. And what I was talking about before, everyone has bias. But in general, like we were just talking about that word cloud. It's just something that like, am I surprised? Not necessarily not surprised at all. Like that's the unfortunate fact of our society, our reality. Um, it definitely, of course, like makes your stomach turn to think yeah. like that's really what people think. But I really enjoy and like take to heart how he um, kind of just, it was also connecting with the audience, but straight up. Like he was saying, this is the fact and these are ways we can battle it. And it kind of gave me a real, um, like reinvigorating my other beliefs. And like already I try to do this in every day, um, try to be a grand diversity, try and think from other people's perspectives. Because as humans, we need to do that in order to interact with others. Right. Have a little bit more empathy, right? right. Just think of it from another perspective. But I think he really said, um, like reinvigorated my want to do that. He said, always check yourself, keep checking yourself. You know, I think we get too lax and when we're too comfortable when we're around people who look and talk like us, you just have to push yourself out of your comfort zone, even though you don't want to. You know, it's interesting though, when I was going through that sound, um, that word cloud rather, sound cloud, obviously something completely different, that word cloud, there were some positives in that cloud of words, but they were small they were diminished compared to the negative words. And if we kind of expanded our horizons a little bit and really saw those positives, you would almost think it's the complete opposite if we were just able to empathize with others. And I think that's kind of the point that you're making as well. Uh, and Jamal, I wonder if you would, and you know, we can kind of go around Robin here. Jamal, why do you think this conversation is so relevant right now? Oh, I think it's it's very relevant right now because of the political and social explosion we've kind of been going through probably since I would say probably the past what five years, but especially this summer, you know, with uh, the COVID nineteen and um, of course with the death of George Floyd and all the uprising now, it's just very important to uh, have this discussion right now because you know a lot of people want to do a lot of good, and of course there's uh, quite a few people that want to do a lot of bad, so it's important to have you know correct information and when we're having these discussions that we know our biases um on both sides too um too that we know our biases so that's why i think it's a it's a very good discussion to have as of now sam what do you next yeah um i think the why it's really important right now is because it's about challenging a system so this isn't going to go away it's always been important um and it probably will be important for a very long time um, but continuing to challenge the system and work to improve it. That is fundamentally, I think, what's most important to take out of this is challenging yourself to be better and challenging everyone else around you to be better and challenging the systems in which you live to be better. Because if you just kind of exist comfortably, like Jordan was saying, if you exist comfortably, you're supporting the system and you're not being an advocate for change. Now, let me, I mean, let me just follow up with you, Sam. How do you challenge your friends, your colleagues, your peers to be better? 
Yeah, it's so challenging um, because everything seems political, you know. Um, but I think the most important thing is trying to build that common ground, just like um, Dr. Mark was doing, is you need to find somewhere that you two can get along. And from that position, anything is possible. So once you guys stand on the same ground, you can get anywhere. Jordan? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, definitely agree with what was Sam was saying. In our era of complete polarization politically, so many things get turned into politics, even though I don't think intrinsically they should. Um, it really is about, like even with those stereotypes and those biases we have against people who don't agree with our political views. You know, it's so hard to have a discussion with someone when you're both saying, I'm right, there's no other perspective, that's it. And like one of the biggest points you have to look at from someone else's perspective, because we all have our own truth. And yes, you may be right and you may come to the conclusion after talking to someone that you still believe what you believe. But without asking questions, of the other person and without asking yourself why you believe the things you do, there's never gonna be any progress. And so this conversation about bias, about all these questions that we have are so important, especially in our day and age. So Jordan, how do you challenge yourself? How do you challenge the people around you? Um, I mean, I think it is definitely difficult to do that. It's like Dr. Mark said, it's not just something that you can switch on. It's not just something that you do for a day and then that's it. Right. It's something that needs to be worked at. It's a skill that you build and something you train yourself to do over time that you look or you look at the people around you and be like, how are they similar to me? Like he was talking about, look at your friend group. Like, yes, you go to school, you go to work and you're forced in this, like in a way to be surrounded by people that are different from you to a certain extent, depending um, but then you go home and look at your best friend, your close friend groups, your family, who do they hang out with? And it's really about, do I treat these people differently or do I not? Do I like go out and try and expand my viewpoints or like, even when you're in public or you go in a store, even though we're not in public as much anymore, like, oh, like even face coverings. Like there's so much that I've seen about like, oh, if a person of color is wearing a bandana, over their face as a face mask or unless they're or a surgical mask, like those biases pop up in people. And it's just so prominent that you need to check yourself. Like I was saying earlier, it's just a constant process of training yourself to question why you do the things you do and why you think that way. And Sam, you know, you mentioned specifically that it's a matter of conversation with your friends and, you know, kind of drilling down to those really conversational basic levels. I mean, you guys are 18 years old. How do you even start that conversation with your friends? Yeah, I think the most important place to start is where. So nobody's really going to be like comfortable if you confront them in a group. You're not going to be comfortable confronting them. And the person being confronted is going to get very defensive very quickly. So I think what's most important is kind of confronting people in private if you're going to confront them. Um, right now, text is a great way because, um, I mean, although you lack the ability to kind of see their body language, one of the strengths of text is you can kind of slowly come down from your, if you, if you were planning to die on a hill, it's a lot easier to come down from that hill on, over text in my experience. Um, it's like much easier to shift a perspective over text because as you start to read things, it processes a lot more than just like seeing it to me, at least. That's interesting because I think I would assume, or, you know, and I don't want to assume anything, but you know, I know from example, there are many times when text messages or things that are written are almost taken out of context and misconstrued. Uh, but it sounds like what you're saying is that if it's in front of your face, you're able to kind of take that deep breath without responding immediately you're able to have that conversation and kind of come to terms a little bit faster. Yeah, and you're right. It is very challenging because, you know, I could text somebody and they can just take a picture of it and send it to their friends who all have very similar beliefs. And in that case, it's, you know, not as effective as it would be talking to them mm -hmm. in person. So taking different approaches is definitely important if you don't see change. How do you have that conversation, Sam, with somebody who doesn't look like you? 
Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's not something that I've really had to deal with. Sure. But from somebody who doesn't really know, um, start by building common ground. I mean, that's the start of anything. Jamal, let me defer to you here. I mean, you've obviously got to have some sort of an opinion here. How do you have that conversation? How do you start that conversation with your peers? Well, first and foremost, we have to want the conversation. We have to be willing to have the conversation, eager to have the conversation. And the key word is conversation, not debate. We're right. not here to argue. We're not here to attack or try to prove people wrong. You should actually, you know, as I would say, try your hardest to prove yourself wrong. And so when we have this discussion, you know, we find out that we maybe do, we do want the same thing. Hey, you know, it's not a matter of politics like we've all said here. It's a matter of, you know, they just want to be, you know, treated like this person. So good, we agree here. Now, maybe we may disagree on how to get there and whatnot. Well, we can explain, you know, how we think we should get there. Well, this is why I feel this way. And I have the, you know, the facts. This is why I think so. Well, wow, I kind of agree with that. So that's when we had a discussion and when you're willing to want the discussion and you're naturally at ease, you know, when you are um, combative or try to, um, you know, come in a little tense and that's where, you know, you automatically have someone being defensive and that just gets no progress done. So we have to want to have that discussion. I love what you just said, though, and it's, I think, so important to highlight and reiterate. There are two D's here, right? The, num the first one is debate. That second one is discussion. But what you're saying is don't do the first you're saying don't debate be able to have that discussion and come in with an open mind um you know and i think that there are so many people who would rather prove themselves right as you're saying as opposed to almost hearing the other side and perhaps proving themselves wrong yeah uh, yeah i agree i agree with that completely that's a, that's a very um, accurate analysis thank you i appreciate it uh, let's move on here tonight to uh, the cancel culture. Uh, one of the most recent instances focuses on those six Dr. Seuss books that contained racist imagery. So should these books be erased or can they be used as a learning tool to show where we've been, where we can go? Jordan, I'd like to start with you here. Well, I actually have thought about this question. Um, I don't have a solid answer for you. I'm going to be honest. Okay. Um, I cancel culture is something that I have struggled with personally, like my own moral compass, my own moral debates, because in history and our society culture, we have people that we look up to that we right. listen to their music, we read their literature, um, celebrities, things like that, politicians. And sometimes things come out about them that are horrible or even smaller things that depends on your point of view, how bad they are on a moral scale and a moral compass. Um, I personally am still trying to find a balance between that because do we like the questions that we have to ask ourselves, like, because this person did, or like Dr. Seuss, for example, wrote these things in these books are all of his books canceled. Like, do we not associate anything with him whatsoever? If a uh, artist celebrity does one thing and then they apologize or like apologize for it afterwards, regret what they did, depending on the severity of their actions, do we keep listening to music? Do we not? Even if it's like the most iconic, like personally, I grew up reading Dr. Seuss. You know, I think uh, many generations um, to current day, they're incredibly popular, popular cultural books that a lot of kids love and can recite and rhyme to. But when you look at who wrote that and this other part of them, do are we able to associate, disassociate that or do we have to associate that? And I think personally, I'm still struggling with that because for some things, I don't think an entire person should be judged on the worst of their actions or the best necessarily. But it is like, if you have something racist in books, like, is this person racist? That Are there other things that we don't see in these other books that are possibly being, like, pushed into our subconscious that we don't know about and things like that? So it's still a personal struggle with me. Um, but I think a lot of people have made up their minds and a lot of people still haven't. 
You know, it's so interesting because, it, first of all, that's a very honest answer, and I appreciate your candor here. Um, I mean, we don't have to know everything, right? Um, so what about the books that kind of take us out of our comfort zone um, or movies that take us out of our comfort zone um, that make things a little bit uncomfortable? I mean, where do we go from here? What, what's your opinion on, what's your take on that? Um, sorry, I just want to clarify. What do you mean, like, what um, literature and stuff that takes takes you out of your comfort zone in what way? Like, in ways that are, like, intentionally racist or ways that are trying to display things that are uncomfortable subjects? Like yeah, take, for instance, Gone with the Wind, right? Okay. Um, that's something that might take you out of your comfort zone. You know, a lot of people, To Kill a Mockingbird uh, is, uh, you know, regarded obviously as a classic, but takes us out of our comfort zone in, in certain cases. Um, you know, you could say the same thing about Huckleberry, Huckle, Huckleberry Finn. Um, you know, where, what do, we, do we use that as a tool? Do we kind of take it out of our system? Right. I mean, personally, I don't like like censorship for a lot of things. And I know it's censorship is a strong word because of course there are things like hate speech that is a very controversial topic, but I do believe in learning from these things. Like when my teachers teach something or we read a book or something like you can't go into it saying, I have no bias about this. This story is complete fact. Like there is no situation about that. So sure in like books or films or what that have been historically taught in one way or read in one way and then as times change as society's views change they're seen as this is not okay anymore i think it's important to learn from those and like if you're uncomfortable reading it i think everyone should push themselves out of the comfort zones to an extent but I, I think it's important to learn from those and educate yourself on those, but also recognize everyone has bias. Times were different. Like put yourself in the situation of the characters, but also take a step back and look at it from an outside perspective. So Jamal, let me go to you on that point. Uh, times were different then. Times are obviously very different now. So what do we do? Where do we go? And do we use these as a tool? Yeah, you know, times were very different. You know, as far as Dr. Seuss books, I don't, um, I don't think cancel culture is the, uh, the proper term to put under them. I mean, uh, it was six books from what I understand, and they, they, they were, like I said, it's different times. So they reviewed them. The images were were pretty racist, and they decided to take those six books off the market. Which I mean, they're a private company; they have the right to do that. No one's forcing them to do it. So I don't necessarily think cancel culture would be the uh, the proper term for that necessarily. But um. You know, as far as some of the, you know, some of the other celebrities or other, um, you know, kids or or whatnot, just random people, you know, I think I agree with George, kind of like a delicate ban balance with cancel culture. Um, do some people deserve it? Um, sure. And some people, you know, should be canceled at this, but at the same time, is it is more performative? Are we just going to, you know, do it for everything? Are we just going to you know, put limits whatsoever? We can do it to kids too, um, you know? So you're like, are, are you, like, what are you hoping to gain? We're hoping to prove. Are you just trying to be performative here? And so it is kind of a delicate balance, but I do think as far as like the Seuss books, I don't necessarily, um, what I wouldn't necessarily associate cancel culture with it. Interesting perspective. Exactly. And Sam, I'm going to switch gears here on you. Uh, what are you hopeful for, for your generation? And what do you teach maybe your children in the future? Yeah. Um, can I just go back to the last point real quick? Uh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I just did a historical tour um, of UVA virtually. And UVA is a campus that was built by slaves. Mm -hmm. In the South. In the South. Yeah. And they have monuments of Confederate leaders around the city. And students at UVA are working to change the way that these statues are viewed. Some students are working to remove them. Um, I think some students, regrettably, are working to preserve them. But I think most students are working on recontextualizing them. Yeah. which I think is what Jordan was kind of starting to talk about earlier, which is taking the perspective and shifting it to a modern perspective. So I think that's most similar to this Dr. Seuss book thing. I don't think it's necessarily cancel culture. I think it's closer to this times were different back then. Let's put the modern spin on and tell the story with a modern viewpoint. So, so can I just interrupt for a second? Do you take those statues down or do you keep them up and learn from them? Yeah, so if you keep them up, the point is you need to recontextualize them. 
it's not Robert E. Lee was a great soldier. It's right. Robert E. Lee led the South, and this is what he did wrong. And by recontextualizing it, you are framing the person's memory. So monuments are typically a thing of honor. But in a sense, you could also have a monument to dishonor something. And by recontextualizing these awful monuments, you can make it a dishonor to these people. Sam, I'm going to ask you for a final thought here. Your thought for your generation. We'll go back to the original question. Um, for Can you say the question one more time? Sure. What are you hopeful for for your generation? And what do you teach your kids going forward? Yeah. So you need to teach your kids history. I mean, plain and simple. You teach your kids what happened and you teach your kids the right history. Um, I know that in our in my um, classes, we were talking about the 1776 project mm -hmm. um, versus the 1619 project. Um, I think I've got those dates right. But one of them starts with the US history starting in 1776 and doesn't teach anything from before then. And what you miss when you don't teach history from before then is a large portion of the African-American um, perspective. And you need to teach that to have the context to continue American history. So I think what's most important is teaching your kids history and contextualizing anything that they encounter. Context is key. And Jamal, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, can you just, just repeat the question again? Sure. Your final thoughts here. What's your hope for your generation? Yeah, um, my hopes is kind of, um, kind of similar to what Sam said. I hope we just kind of just keep this up, that we are uniquely politically and socially active which is very good. And, you know, we should, you know, dare to keep being this active and dare to learn more and, you know, do something about it with all these, um, you know, knowledge that we're learning and all the um, deficiencies with that, with that's in, you know, the law or our various systems here in um, in America. And so I would hope that I, my biggest hope for this generation is that we keep this um, activism up. Jordan, we're in a very unique position here, uh, you know, and as Jamal said, I mean, we have the opportunity, your generation at least, has the opportunity for real change and to promote change. So where do you go? Um, I mean, I think it is very important. Like we see throughout history that young generations, once they feel passionate about something and start to connect and start to um, really educate themselves and try and educate others about it, they can like the younger generations can be one of the most powerful forces. And like the we quote all the time, like the kids are the future. And I think everything, all of the turmoil, all of the conflict that is, has been happening in the past years, it is happening because there has been so much that was never brought up. There's so much in our history that we need to address. And I think our generation specifically with the resources that we have, despite <laughs> pandemic, um, are very vocal, are very active. We see Black Lives Matter movements. We see um, March for Our Lives, women's rights movements. Like all of these things keep coming up and keep happening. And I think it's just going to get better. I mean, there is definitely good with the bad. There is a lot of violence and um, hate that happens, but these discussions need to be had. And I think our generation specifically are not afraid to have them. And I've said this before, we need to have these discussions no matter how difficult they are, but they have to be discussions. They can't be through violence. They can't be through debate. And I like that point, Jamal. Thank you guys so much. The three of you have very bright futures ahead of you. And I certainly appreciate your time. Thank you again for being with us. You just heard youth panelists from the NFJC of Western New York offering their perspectives on the hidden bias of good people. The conversation continues in just a moment. So stay with us as we get our next group of panelists ready to go. Coming up in our next half hour, you'll be hearing from the adult members of the NFJC as we work to better understand the hidden bias of good people. We'll be right back. Discussion going in depth on the hidden bias of good people. We're so glad you're with us for this timely and meaningful conversation. In our last half hour, we heard from student board members from the National Federation for Just Communities getting their perspective. So now we want to bring in our adult representatives from the NFJC board. And of course, we'll introduce you to them one by one. Joining them in our joining us in this half hour is Dr. Tamara Alsace, Joanna Chen, Michael Martin, Bernie Tolbert, 
Bradford Watts and Emily Perryman. Thank you all for being with us for part of tonight's discussion. Uh, let's first begin with the question that we first posed to our student panelists. Uh, and Bradford, we'll begin with you. What did you make of Dr. Mark's presentation? I thought it was quite insightful from Dr. Marks to take a personal, more introspective uh, look at, you know, hidden biases, um, unconscious bias that we all have when it comes to even some of the more mundane things that we do day to day. Um, I found it on my own respects to find it challenging to not only have biases when I go just out the door. If not, I've already had that encounter just in the home. So it, it's, it's important, I believe, for us to work with uh, those to have a discussion which allows for those unconscious biases to come forth, but then to continue the discussion so that we can both engage and learn. It's interesting, a lot of the students had that same thought, uh, that it was more of a conversational approach. And I suggested that it was almost as if Dr. Marx gave us the why this is happening, that we don't necessarily hear all the time. Why do we have these implicit biases? Why do we have these hidden biases that you know we generally don't really know or ever really confront, yet we almost confront them every single day as we go throughout our daily lives. It's just a matter of taking that time to really be able to do that. Joanne, I see you nodding your head. What, what did you make of the presentation? Oh, I thought it was really excellent. I thought that Dr. Marks was able to unpack a lot of complicated issues in a concise and really effective way. I think he was very good at, you know, diffusing, um, you know, any sort of a defensiveness that people might feel when they're approaching the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. A lot. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, if I could add, I thought I agree with Joanna. I also thought that he presented in a way that how could you not agree with him? I mean, it was very plain, very simple, and very straightforward. He didn't attack anyone. He just kind of like, this is where it was. And so it was almost like a primer. If you can't get this, if you can't understand this. You know, what can, what can you do? And I, I thought that was really effective. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So can I ask just as a, I mean, you can raise your hand here. Did you all choose Denmark, Orange? And uh, what was the what was the last one? I'm missing the third. Kangaroo. Kangaroo. Thank you, Kangaroo. 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 Right. Did you all I, I choose did. those three things? Yeah. I did. <laughs> Isn't that so crazy? I mean, we all have the same thought and he nailed it on the head when, and I, I mean, it was, you know, like a sleight of hand magic trick. Yet this is something that we all, no matter our backgrounds, were able to nail. Uh, that to me was mind boggling. Uh, Dr. Alsace, we'll go to you. It, oh, yes, I thought that um, his presentation was right on the mark and very comprehensible uh, to anyone. He really broke down the terminology. Um, he also brought in, for me as a, as a child of immigrants and one who used to say we're a nation of immigrants <laughs> until I right. learned. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciated that he brought in that aspect as well uh, when he said uh, you don't have the right or the standing to judge someone's Americanism um, because we're all a, a nation of foreigners. I thought that was really impactful. You know, he also said when you know better, you can do better. So Emily, mm -hmm. I'm wondering why you might think that this conversation is so relevant right now. Well, you know, I think it's always been an important conversation, really. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why uh, it's important now. But I think there's one thing in particular that comes to mind um, that that really kind of tells us why reflecting on our biases is, is really essential. And that's because right now um, we are living through a pandemic, COVID-19. Um, it's really, in a lot of ways, a, a healthcare tragedy right here in our own country. Um, and hundreds of thousands of people um, have passed away and people are needing care and treatment. Um, and the thing is, explicit bias exists in healthcare. Um, and I think it's something that we might not want to think about or we might not believe that it exists, um, especially in those who are supposed to care for us um, in a hospital or healthcare care setting. Um, but it does exist, and we really need to take the time to be aware of and learn about those existing biases and, and that ultimately they might be detrimental to, to others. Um, and in this case in particular, um, 
as we administer care, provide health care guidance to people. Um, there was uh, there was recently, very recently, an article I read that stated that racism is entrenched um, in our healthcare system, um, as it is in many other institutions and systems in this country. Um, and it's not pretty, but that is the reality. That is the truth. Um, and what we know from um, you know these last 12 months is that COVID-19 is disproportionately harming Black Americans, and that's not an exception. That is the rule. Um, and just being somebody who works in a higher ed, higher ed institution that educates um, a lot of students who go into the health sciences or the healthcare fields, statistics like 14% of second year med students wrongly believe that black people are less sensitive um, or have less sensitive nerve endings than white people. Um, that's an alarming statistic. I think an even more alarming statistic is that 243% more often than white women, black women die from pregnancy or childbirth. That's terrifying. So Emily, let me just interrupt for a second, and I don't mean to cut you off here, but I think you're making some really interesting points and have some interesting perspective as a higher ed institution. How do you change those perspectives and how do you confront them to say, okay, slow down for a second, Let's change that focus. It starts, it starts right in the higher education classroom. It starts right in the textbooks and the discussions that are had and the, um, the clinical experiences of students. It's making sure that faculty and staff um, represent the student body and that students have people that they can identify with. Mm -hmm. Um, and understanding um, their personal experiences, having cultural competencies, making sure that all of that is baked in to the learning experience so that when these students um, are serving others or helping others or taking care of others, they have um, knowledge of what something like explicit bias can mean. I mean, it can honestly mean life or death. You know, and it's interesting too, Dr. Marks also kind of mentioned it's, it's, these biases are, you know, might be a little in each person, but spread across the system. That's what creates the problem. And I think that for so many people was so eye opening. I know it was for me, you know, because we hear so much about how the system this and the system that, but we don't realize what comprise what's com what makes up the system, right? And it's all and of the individuals. And we don't realize it when maybe it doesn't affect us personally. Right. And the systems are are in such different categories. To Emily's point. In academia, yes, you can hit it, hit a home run in terms of meeting it in the classroom. But uh, when we get down to the street level of things, uh, we've got a mental health crisis that also has been impacted in that, as well as where there's been so many social injustices that have occurred. We forget a lot of times that, yes, our, our overall, the overall health of those that are in many times in marginalized areas of communities of color, uh, but also uh, in, in our uh, re, uh, rural uh, areas that also impact that. Um, my brother on there, Michael Martin, can speak in terms of uh, an indigenous population has also been affected on these things on a multiple scale level uh, in terms of not only uh, our overall physical health but, health, but the mental health impacts that also occur during these things and the crises that has allowed this through COVID is that the engagement process has been affected uh, uh, on an enormous level because so, now you can't speak to those things. And many times that's where engagement truly happens is one-on-one, -on -one, person to person. Uh, and a lot of times when we don't know those unconscious or hidden biases are lying in there, you can't get to the heart of the matter. So Michael, that's a perfect segue. Let me bring you in here. How do you confront those uh, hidden biases, what's the conversation, and did it make you rethink your own biases? Yeah, I think the presentation uh, really does make us all reflect. I mean, we all should. I mean, there's, there's hidden biases as the uh, exercise with the pick a number and, you know, the Denmark kangaroo orange came out. You know, that's because of how we're educated in this country. You know, we picked Denmark over J J Djibouti or another country because that's not what's taught to us. And I remember even back in the day, you know, so it really made me think about my own education experience and what what was I taught? And we know there's all kinds of, of lacking of uh, a true full history uh, in our textbooks still to this day in our educational systems. Um, and uh, we also have to look at what the images were portrayed in movies and TV, as well as, 
you know, all kinds of different uh, how it's portrayed in the news. I used to get a lot more, it feels when I was younger, a lot more world news than I do today. Um, you have 24 hour news channels and a multitude of them, yet they still focus uh, very narrowly and mostly on politics today. And that helps feed this divide that we have in our country. And I think having a more global mindset allows us to see people for people and, and hopefully focus us on our common humanity as a way of building empathy for each other and understanding. And that's where if we have different experiences and we have different uh, education, we can have a, a greater, uh, like we could do better, like he was saying in the presentation. I remember it, as a Native American talking to a Native American father and he had a young son and there, there was a Western on TV and he's shooting with his little finger gun and he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, we're, you know, cowboys and Indians. And he goes, what are you doing? Oh, I can shoot the Indians. He goes, wait a minute, we're, we're Native American. And he turns to his dad and he does that. Like how powerful an image that is, yeah. and how things get ingrained into the mindset of people. And so we have to, I think we all have to be aware of our, how we've been educated and what experiences have been laid out to us, but also challenge them at the same time. So that and brings up a really, oh, go ahead, Bernie. Well, I just, it's interesting, Michael, you mentioned education because one of the things that I thought about while watching uh, Dr. Marks was that he was talking about how people just because of, you know, the repeated exposures and things. When I was, I went to Buffalo Public Schools and I, I graduated from high school. And I was thinking not once during my high school career did a guidance counselor ever talk to me about going to college. Never, never mentioned it. It weren't for the fact that, I don't know, luck, whatever it was, but that I, that I ended up going to college. But the guidance counselor whose job it is to push me to a higher education to achieve as much as I can, never, I was never told you should go to college. Ever. And that brings me to my next question. And I think, Michael, Bernie, you both have kind of hit the nail on the head. When have you been on the receiving end of this implicit bias or a hidden bias? And how do you react to that? And Joanna, I want to go to you. Well, um, you know, I think we, everybody on this panel can probably speak to their own personal experiences. And it's a reflection of, of who we are. And as a, as a Chinese American, you know, I get a lot of uh, questions about where I'm from. No, where are you really from? You know, I've been asked point blank whether or not I'm an American citizen. Um, and and as an attorney uh, going to court, uh, even though I'm wearing a suit, I get mistaken for a paralegal or a court reporter, anything but, you know, an attorney, even though I'm a partner at a law firm. So, um, you know, the experiences can be hurtful, uh, but also I, I try to spin it in a positive way. Uh, when I go to a courtroom and people underestimate me, that's that's not a disadvantage. You know, I just try to take full advantage of that. It's interesting too, you know, myself as a Jewish gay man, you know, it's kind of like we kind of jokingly are self-deprecating sometimes because it takes the sting out of it. But all things considered, that shouldn't necessarily have to be but if we confront these things in our conversations and our discussions, it kind of people start to see that and they have that empathy and can kind of put themselves in your shoes. And I think that kind of leads me to my next question, Bernie, you know, you are a respected member of law enforcement and so much of this um, conversation is based on things that have happened between law enforcement and communities, uh, especially of color over the last several years, months, um, you know, not only here, but across the country. So, you know, not only as a former law enforcement member, you know, but also as a black man, you must have seen both sides when it comes to confronting hidden biases. So where do you see this going? Well, uh, I, you're right. I have seen it, both sides of it. Certainly um, when I was uh, applying, going through the process of getting into the FBI, I was turned down by the FBI initially because they said that I wasn't physically fit. And I had been in the FBI office, I'd seen some of the agents. And, and at that time I was a young man, I was I was probably in two or three basketball leagues, playing on a couple of softball teams. I was always engaging in physical activity, yet they said I wasn't physically fit. And they said it's because I had I had, had a knee operation. And um, I mean, what they did was, uh, they had seen that the team doctor at, at UB who had done my most of my surgeries at when they said, well, he's not a, an orthopedic surgeon, especially. So they had me go see an orthopedic up at the VA hospital. I went in, he looked at me, he said, ah, he said, you'll be in a wheelchair by the time you're 50. 
but they're wasting their time. And 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 they let me in. So they they automatically I I I took that as I saw the other guys, some of the other guys now, I knew I was in better shape than them. How could they tell me I'm not fit? But I also saw the other side when I was going through that process. I can remember walking into City Hall. My mom worked in City Hall at the time, and I stopped by to see her. And some of the people who worked in the office that she worked in said, uh, you know, how can you do that? How can you go into the FBI? Look at what they did to Dr. Martin Luther King. And and so there was a there was a feeling in the Black community, certainly, that the FBI wasn't to be trusted. And my response, my thought was, well, maybe we need to get some of us in there, and we can have people to trust. But also, I said, why should I not if it's a good job or an honorable job and it's a job that's well respected, why shouldn't I aspire to be that too? Why do I have to not do that because you know someone else feels that it's not some you know it's not a because of the biases in the FBI. So yeah, I, I've seen it. Dr. Alsace, I want to go to you. When a bias is identified, what do you think we can do to confront it and how do we address it? Uh, well, I will say that that depends, but I think that you've started to touch on that. We have to all admit uh, that we have biases. Uh, I'm Dominican and I said Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> I've been indoctrinated like everyone else. And, uh, and then, it, you know, it depends on whether it's an individual type situation or if it's a, more of a systemic or institutional type situation to address. Uh, on the individual level, we need to feel empowered to speak up when that, when we hear um, offensive language, uh, uh, an off-color joke. Um, we have to be able to speak up and say that offends me, uh, or um, ask ask a, a clarifying question. Did you really mean to say that all you know of these people are this? And uh, and if it's more on a on an institutional level, it might involve you know, getting some training in um, that addresses the culture and building a, a, a community that respects each other, um, bringing in um, uh, maybe going to the HR department or, uh, you know, a, a more systemic approach if it's a systemic issue. Um, but there are lots of trainings available out there. We saw a wonderful presentation tonight in our own organization, NFJC, that's what we do. And uh, we work with uh, all kinds of organizations to, to have these uh, difficult discussions um, with, with individuals and with groups. So one of the topics that we discussed in our last half hour is the idea of this so-called cancel culture. The students had a lot to say, uh, especially about one of the most recent instances when it comes to those six Dr. Seuss books that were essentially uh, taken out of production, right, because of what was purported to be racist in images. Um, should they be erased from our culture? Should they be taken out of production or should they be used as a tool to kind of say, this is where we were, this is where we are, and here's where we're going? And Bradford, I'll start with you. I, I think uh, coming from a human service perspective, um, working with the agency that we work with, developmental, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, uh, special needs populations, um, Many times you have artifacts and information uh, of words that were used uh, sometimes on a clinical level that was then taken over for pop culture terms uh, that were used in the R word, the retired word, yeah. um, and many times of classifications that were used in those. But we developed uh, through an agency, we had a museum of history that chronicled those things to use them as learning tools. So I believe it's not something to be canceled out, but to be used in a vein of where the discussions are happening. They're pulling them off the shelves, but using them also in historical uh, perspectives as well as teaching tools. So I believe uh, they can still be utilized in a way for learning. Uh, I always say, you know, we get the shortest month uh, for Black History Month, but we live it every day. I live it, Bernie. We live it each and every day. So it's all year. And the African-American diaspora is not uh, just African-American history, it's American history. So I believe the same in the context of many of these um, atrocities or uh, learning experiences need to continue to happen so that we can have these discussions uh, to know where we're going in the future. And Bernie, I know you wanted to weigh in here. What are your thoughts? You know, I thought of uh, 
uh, an old TV program, and I'm probably old, I'm older than most of you, so you may uh, not, not, not may not have seen it, but the old Amos and Andy series. Um, you know, I, as a kid, a young kid, I enjoyed that. It it was funny, and I laughed at it, and that was taken pretty much. People now, they talk about they they talk about what a uh, a negative thing it was, the connotation made for of African Americans, and you know, the Stephen Fletchers, you know, shuffling and that type of person. And and I thought how sad it was that I looked at that and I saw that that was entertaining. I enjoyed mm -hmm. it, um, and, and so now. In those kinds of situations, I reckon Richard Pryor, he had a, a character called Mudbone, who he stopped talking about. He wouldn't talk about anymore because it was demeaning. But I remember enjoying laughing at his stand up comedy routines that involved Mudbone. So, you know, this implicit bias that hits us, it, it's it's difficult. And, and I think it gets into what you know, Emily said earlier, like in higher education, you have them in the you talk about it, and you do it, you know, but I personally think well, if we don't get if we get wait to higher education to get to people, it's way too late. They've been so ingrained with this. The implicit biases are so entrenched, so much a part of their life. We'll never get rid of it. So that's why it's such a, a daunting and difficult um, task and, a, a, and discussion. And I think that's happening all across the country. I can tell you, you know, as a young adult going through higher education, I wasn't exposed to the diversity that you see on a higher institution or a higher learning campus until the age of 18, right? I mean, we grew up in communities, each of us different from each from one another, but that kind of is what Dr. Marks was saying is that that's what helps create our foundation for that hidden bias. So Emily, let me switch gears then. So how do we then perform that honest self assessment and confront our own biases? I think, um, you know, to echo what Bernie said, it, it can't start at 18. It can't start. It's got to start so much sooner. I have two young children. And um, one of the best things that I think our family has done is brought in the work and brought in the mission of the NFJC to our home and to our family experience. So um, I'm so happy to see the things that I see my children are learning about and discussing in school, but we take it, you know, home as well. And maybe it's um, talking about a lesson that was taught in school for Black History Month. Maybe it's discussing something in a book that maybe one of my children has a question about. It's attending an NFJC event when we can do that again and kind of bringing it back to what it means and scaling it to, you know, a young child. But it's, it's about having discussions. And I think the sooner that we have discussions about things, even about topics that are really hard to talk about, the better. Um, so anytime that, you know, you talked about the Dr. Seuss books, those are, those to me, I think, can ultimately be really great educational tools, maybe not for elementary school children, but for older children to really dissect it a little bit. So Michael, what are you hopeful for, for our next generation? And, you know, how do you get them to move forward? I'm still hopeful for this generation. You know, <laughs> I think uh, if you, you really heed the presentation tonight, there's a lot we can do today, right? You just raising and opening our eyes, having more awareness, really being honest with that self-assessment. Um, and I, that's why the, the title of the program, Hidden Bias of Good People, you know, it's not always ill-intended that somebody's, you know, has these biases, but to understand the impact of them and how it plays out and can be harmful to others. Again, that just brings us back to our common humanity and building that empathy and understanding of each other. You know, we're just human beings on this tiny little planet in this vastness of the, you know, uh, infinity of the universe. Um, and we all, no matter where we are as human beings on this planet, we all have the same basic needs, right? Clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, food to eat, shelter and warmth when we're cold. We all want a sense of belonging. We all smile in the same language. It's that common humanity that we need to focus on more. And, uh, and I know if we can work together, we'll to meet everyone's needs. But and equity itself has to be intentional. You know, it's not going to solve itself. You know, it takes all of us making intentional efforts to address equity in our community. Joanna, I want to give you the final thought here. Uh, your last kind of idea about overall uh, the overarching theme here. Well, I don't know that I can say it better than Michael. I think it's really, you know, key for everyone to just be open 
to you know be willing to engage in these uncomfortable conversations and to engage in that self-reflection that's really needed to to progress thank you so much for being with us here tonight we're gonna to have to leave the conversation there we really appreciate your eye-opening perspectives here uh and of course there is so much more to be talked about, but it's a matter of having that discussion, as the students said, as opposed to the debate. Thank you all once again for being here with us thank tonight. We'd like to thank all of their panel, all of the panelists for their participation in tonight's discussion. We'd especially like to thank the NFJC and its director, Renee Pettys jones for helping to make it happen. So to learn more about Dr. Bryant Marks and how to tackle implicit bias, make sure to check out the resources posted right now on WKBW.com. So as you saw tonight, there is a lot to talk about, and it's really important that we have these conversations, but we do it with decorum and we do it with respect for one another because together we're Buffalo strong. From the 7 Eyewitness News team, we certainly thank you once again for being with us. Have a great night.